Thanks to everyone for joining us at our Dysgraphia Life webinar. Um, for those of you who are new to the Dysgraphia Life community, our purpose is to provide education, information, products and services to those who have trouble with writing. And so what we're doing today is we have a webinar by renowned expert, Dr. Stephen Pfeiffer. Dr. Pfeiffer has authored eight books on learning and emotional disorders in children. He has more than 20 years of experience as a school psychologist, and he's duly trained in school neuropsychology with research stints at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Pfeiffer has earned numerous distinctions throughout his career, including being awarded both the Maryland School Psychologist of the Year and National School Psychologist of the Year. Dr. Pfeiffer currently assesses children at the Monocacy Neurodevelopmental Center in Frederick, Maryland, and is a consultant to a variety of school districts. He's authored three tests on diagnosing learning disabilities in children, all of which are published by PAR. So we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Pfeiffer here today. I will say that I got to see him speak previously and I was really impressed with his scientific background and how he applied that to the educational setting and how I really thought about evidence-based practices in education. I think you will learn a lot from him. Um, a few logistics, there is the chat. If you look in the chat, you can find the handouts for today's webinar. There's a link there where you can go download a PDF of the handouts. We will also be taking questions at the end. Throughout the entire webinar, you can answer, you can enter questions into the Q&A and we will be able to look at those questions and get to some of them at the end. I'm gonna put up a quick poll just for everyone to get started about what one aspect of written language your child struggles with the most. So we would love to see the, your answers to this as we will um, be talking about these different areas and learning about them from Dr. Pfeiffer later in the webinar. Thanks to everybody, I see the answers going up fast. We'll leave the poll open for a minute, but it's almost equally split between all three categories, penmanship, handwriting, spelling, and organization of thoughts or composition, we've got a, a big turnout for all three with handwriting just slightly leading the way. Um, yes, I'm gonna get questions about the PDF. I will post those again. And with that near tie with handwriting just slightly winning, I will turn it over to Dr. Pfeiffer and let him get started. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It looks like handwriting by a nose has won our straw poll for today. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for what you are doing for children, uh, Jennifer, by uh, starting uh, this foundation, uh, uh, Dysgraphia uh, Life, to try to bring a little bit more awareness to uh, what's really a very common um, uh, disorder among many of our students. So. I want to welcome you all uh, to our webinar. Um, I am going to uh, give a give an overview and try to hit some some high spots in the area of written language and dysgraphia. Uh, and we'll have a formal PowerPoint presentation for about 40, 45 minutes, but then really want to open it up to your questions. And if we're unable to uh, to get to one of your questions, uh, my email is right there on the very first slide, and you'll see it on the final slide. Well, a very, very pleasant uh, introduction uh, from Jennifer. Thanks so much. This is a little bit uh, about me. And uh, I'm taking another quick look at the poll. Yeah, it looks like, looks like handwriting is, is, is the winner, slightly ahead of organizational thoughts and composition. Uh, a little bit about me, and you heard that from, uh, from Jennifer's kind introduction. I'm uh, right here in the, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm up here in Frederick, Maryland. Um, not too far, uh, hopefully from where you are. I hope everybody is staying safe. And uh, so happy you can join us uh, in this format. Um, maybe next time we get together, it can be more of a face-to-face of -face, uh, type of talk, but given um, today's circumstances, Zoom seems to be our best format for delivering instruction. I'm also, as Jennifer mentioned, in private practice. I still, after being in the schools for over 20 years, I'm still testing kids, still working with families, but uh, much on, more on a part-time basis, the Monocacy Neurodevelopmental Center right up here in Frederick is where I continue to evaluate students. 
but also uh, do consult with uh, school districts all over the country about many learning issues. And the one we're going to talk about today is written language disorders. That is our third book in. Um, so a lot of for those who want to go into a deeper dive about this, this is our book, The Neuropsychology of Written Language Disorders. Uh, just so you know, <clears throat> um, our official disclosures. Yes, I do get royalties from book sales or test sales, but for this speaking engagement, it is just my pleasure to be here. All right, well, let's jump in. Let's talk a little bit about writing and why so many of you have joined us today. And um, we're gonna take things uh, just sort of uh, on a global level first about um, just how prevalent is this issue of writing? By the way, what is dysgraphia in the first place? And uh, we're gonna dive a little bit into the brain. You heard uh, about my background, uh, more in neuropsychology, but we're gonna get into your classroom really, really quickly. So a couple of quick facts about written expression. And yes, all of you will have access. Um, these slides have uh, been posted, you'll get a PDF. As we begin our journey talking about writing, the fact of the matter is here in 2021, writing is our preferred mode of communication whether it's email, text, messages, social media, uh, you tell me, this is how we tend to communicate more than any other way is through some form of written expression. Now in Washington, DC, we have the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP. NAEP is commissioned in charge with measuring trends in learning, reading trends, writing trends, behavioral trends, mathematics trends, and when you look at the data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and they look at literally hundreds of thousands of students every two or three years, they update their studies on whichever trend they're looking at in learning. These are massive, massive studies, uh, which is why I tend to rely, uh, rely on, on their data quite a bit uh, with a, just a huge normative sample. What we see is about 54% of eighth graders and 52% of 12th graders are performing at a basic level in written expression. Basic would mean their skills are not quite on grade level. If you are in grade level, they term that proficient. If you're ahead of grade level, that would be advanced. As you take a deeper look at this, that suggests that more than half of our students who are graduating high school have writing skills not quite up to, to grade level. And for the males who are listening to me today, just lower your head just for a minute, just for a minute. We're killing the average that females um, are, are really um, have a quite an advantage over males when it comes to writing. Why do males struggle so much when it comes to written expression? Hopefully we can answer that as our workshop unfolds. What we do know is that not only do students spend much more time outside of school writing, because in our culture, this is our preferred mode of communication, but we're spending a lot more time in school writing. Nearly 60% of our day is actively engaged in the process of written expression or some other fine motor related endeavor. Uh, and in my many years in schools, we've seen the curriculum change quite a bit. And curriculums change in only one direction. They go down. What that means is we expect more from our students at earlier grades. I mean, since when are we doing algebra in the fourth grade? What, what, when did that start happening? Solving for X. Since when did kindergarten become academic? I mean, we are expecting much more out of our students as curriculums change and the ebb and flow and they change each and every year, but they tend to a change in one direction, that is downward. So we are expecting more from our students at earlier ages. We not only have to, even in other subjects such as mathematics, get a correct answer, we're now supposed to explain that answer. We're doing a lot more writing in, inside the classroom. We're certainly writing more outside the classroom because it's our preferred mode of communication in our culture. But the bottom line is where's the data that we're getting any better in this skill. Writing remains one of the most challenging skills to teach our students. And I think in part because there's so many different genres and styles of writing, prosaic writing and expository writing. And um, you get into, you know, not everyone can be great on every genre. But written language, take it to the bank, is one of the most challenging skills to really cultivate 
and teach our students. But I think one of the reasons it's so difficult is because as we're going to learn, there are so many sub skills and processing um, little components, uh, whether it's on the motor side of things, the working memory side of things, the executive functioning and organizational side of things, the attention, there's so much involved with writing, it poses a great challenge. And hence the term, as well as the name of this foundation, Dysgraphia Life, you might want to ask, okay, well, what exactly, we, we've established that writing is, is definitely an issue for kids, what's dysgraphia? Dysgraphia is a very broad-based term. So when Jennifer put up that straw poll, hey, do you have more concerns in spelling? Do you have more concerns with handwriting? Do you have more concerns with organization of thought to produce on paper? And it was like, yeah, yeah, all of those things. Well, all of those things fall under this big umbrella term called dysgraphia. It can be either on the motoric side of, of, of the ledger difficulty with handwriting, letter formation, spacing between letters. It can be on the spelling side of things, and we're going to try to explain that uh, shortly. Um, or it can be more on the cognitive linguistic side of, I just struggle to organize my thoughts. They're, they're up here, but the disconnect is getting it from up here down on the paper, and, other, and, and therefore I kind of crash and burn. Uh, if I could just say what's on my mind, I could explain it. But to put it on paper, uh, just, it just doesn't come out right. All of these things fall under this big umbrella term called dysgraphia. What I've focused on and what our talk will focus on today is more developmental dysgraphia. That means we're talking about children who just haven't developed this skill of writing in the first place. And what we find is that with younger kids, when we use this term dysgraphia, it tends to mean more children who struggle on the motor side of writing, how to actually execute the written stroke. Whereas older children, later elementary, middle, high school, it's more on the cognitive linguistic side, how to organize my thoughts to deliver and put them on paper. What we're not gonna talk about today is acquired dysgraphia. And that is someone, for example, who really has learned this skill of writing very, very well. Um, but let's say there was some accident or cerebral insult, uh, hit to the head, and uh, now they're struggling uh, to concentrate, struggling to put their thoughts on paper. We will call that acquired dysgraphia. They had it, uh, they, they had the skill, but now they've acquired dysgraphia because of a particular injury. We're not going to really get into that. We want to talk about developmental dysgraphia, meaning I never learned the skill in the first place. Now, most of you listening today uh, are parents, and we have, I'm sure, teachers as well. And the first thing we want to think about is, well, what, what, what should I be looking at? What are some early signs? Depends on the age of your child. So we're talking about preschool age children. One of the things, the, the first thing that jumps off the page is lack of hand dominance, um, awkward pencil grasp. You know, we don't have that nice tripod grasp. We still have the fisted grip. Uh, difficulty forming our letters, writing within margins. You'll note, uh, don't use the other hand to anchor the paper. Now, if you're showing one or two of these things, don't, don't get too alarmed here, but this is in general, you're seeing that with younger children, we look at more motoric elements of the process. Can you manipulate one of these things? Can you execute the motor stroke? Elementary age children, uh, messy handwriting is a giveaway. Mirror writing, uh, especially you see that a lot in second grade uh, where you might be writing backwards. You're trying to spell cat, C-A-T, and it comes out T-A-C. Hmm, why would that be? Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully cover that as our workshop unfolds. Um, slower paced writing and a lot of erasures. Um, at the secondary level, it's more that cognitive linguistic side of writing. Uh, you just have a hard time planning and organizing your thoughts. And by the way, should you have ADHD or should you have some, perhaps some anxiety as well? Um, this can really get in the way of our uh, ability to hold and manipulate thoughts and ideas and working memory, and it just doesn't come out right. So poor planning, poor organization skills, of course, with our ADHD friends, a lot of impulsive writing, 
a lot of erasers, can't uh, take notes, can't keep up in class doing that. When you do write, you don't separate your ideas by paragraph, a lot of disorganization, paragraphs don't really flow, a lot of grammatical issues. So in general, in general, this is what we begin to look for. Now, let's bump this up a level. And I wanna show you a uh, little well, brain slide, hence the title of our of our talk today, the neuropsychology of written language disorders. I've got to show you a brain slide or two. This is some of the early work from Michael Posner. This is what's really important, and I want to hopefully uh, bring this point home to parents and teachers. So let's say that you're just reading words. Let's say you're sitting at, at a computer and words are popping up or flashing up before you you're passively looking at words, you'll notice that the brain's metabolic activity is all the way in the back. So this is the front of the brain here, and here's the back. And in our reading workshop, this is kind of that temporal lobe region, occipital temporal for the folks who are really up to speed in neuropsychology, we might call that the fusiform gyrus. That's sort of that visual verbal learning center. That's kind of where the ability to view, visual view words, uh, back of the brain. Uh, on a, this kind of webinar, you're just going to listen to me uh, talk and run my mouth for about 45 minutes. And you see the metabolic activity when you're listening to words is more directly over the temporal lobes. Uh, and that's sort of the language centers of the brain. If we were in an in-person format and you were raising your hand and asking questions, well, look where the metabolic activity now shifts more to the front of the brain when we have to produce something, when we have to speak words. What I really wanted to show you uh, is a very clever task here. This was a generating verb task the experimenters did. What they did is they gave students a noun and you had to come up with a verb for it. So think of it as a little miniature writing task. Here's a noun, uh, the noun might be hammer. Uh, uh, what's a verb for hammer? A pound. Uh, how about they'd say car, uh, what's a verb that goes with car, uh, drive. So every time they heard a noun, they had to think of a verb to attach to it. Sort of a miniature, how do I assemble my thoughts and language together task. Look at the metabolic activity. Here's what we're saying. Writing more than any other academic task taxes the brain. It's very easy to say that's a lazy kid. That's an unmotivated kid. That's a kid not trying. And, and you know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right on some level. But that's also a student. And most students are apt to burn out and develop mental fatigue if you're not up to speed in writing. And it takes a lot of organization and a lot of thought and a lot of cognitive firepower. Guess what I'm saying is we've all hit writer's block. And you know what that's like. And when you hit writer's block, you know, the best thing to do is just to get away from the task, go walk the dog, go watch TV, go, then go, go back and let the brain cool down a little bit. So hopefully you can formulate your thought. Just because a student isn't producing a lot on paper, doesn't mean they're not trying, doesn't mean they're lazy, but it's so easy if we're not super skilled in this process, to hit writer's block and to kind of fatigue the brain really quickly. And that's what we're trying to show with this slide, if that makes sense. Okay, um, let's get into a bit more of the neuro piece of our talk. Now there's lots that go into the writing process and I wanna talk just about, oh, three or four main cognitive constructs. So there's more than this. And in our, in our big workshop, we, we talked about, but these are some of the main ones in, in our short time together. And for psychologists listening, that's why it's so important when you do a written language assessment to be able to measure these cognitive constructs because all of these impact writing. The first one I talk about is attention. And uh, there is a part of your brain that helps us monitor attention, either focusing that attention to the outside world of objects and events or directing that attention to the inside world of our thoughts and ideas. Now, most of us seamlessly grow up that go throughout the day, 
attention either focused on the outside world and turning it inside then back to the outside. We do that seamlessly. We don't even think about it. It's an area of our brain. It's not important. The brain region isn't important. It's called the anterior cingulate, right up here, bit towards the front of the brain. That's responsible for executive attention. It does that seamlessly, unless you're ADHD. Then you tend to get stuck. So uh, when you think about reading and writing, look at it this way. Reading, I have to focus my attention to the outside world of sticks and symbols. You call them letters and words, and somehow I have to make sense of these letters and words to my inside world. The flow of attention for reading is out to in, but with writing, it's the opposite. I have to start with my inside world, capture my own thoughts and ideas, syntactically arrange and organize these thoughts and ideas in some coherent fashion to deliver them to the outside world. The flow of attention writing is in to out. And if you're ADHD, it's often stuck. It's stuck on the outside world. In other words, you don't self-monitor what you're doing while you're doing it too well. Therefore, you don't plan out what you're going to say because you're very impulsive. There's an uneven tempo to how you write. Your handwriting and legibility is awful. A lot of grammatical and spelling inconsistencies Again, um, when, uh, students with ADHD, the one academic skill they tend to struggle with the most, no doubt about it, is written expression. Not only because of the selective attention of having to go out to in, in to out, out to in, and if you're stuck and you don't come in, you're not gonna be able to self-monitor what you're doing while you're doing it. You're gonna make a lot of careless mistakes. And the other aspects of attention is you better be able to hold, hold, hold your thoughts. You better be able to hold on to them for a protracted period of time to get them out in the slowest manner possible. And that's called letter by letter, paper to pencil transcription. That is an awfully slow way to get it out. Why can't I just say it? I can blurt it out immediately and it puts no pressure on working memory. But no, 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 with writing, it's letter by letter, word by word. You better have awesome attention, concentration, focus, working memory to hold, hold, hold on those thoughts is if you get distracted, you're gonna lose them. And therefore, you're not gonna get much down on paper. Attention is a very important part of the writing process. You know what else is? To be able to sequence your thoughts, sequential production. And the frontal lobes of the brain help us with sequencing. Um, students who have poor sequential production, poor sequencing, um, really have no idea where one paragraph stops and the next one starts. To me, they've always, uh, I thought they've always needed a, a good healthy dose of transitional words. You know, however, therefore, in summary, in conclusion, they need some cohesion and ties um, to connect their thoughts. Um, a lot of times these kids really uh, not only don't separate paragraphs, they just turn you in a big block of stuff, they also don't understand the flow of paragraphs. And the flow of paragraphs have to be from general to specific. That's the flow of a paragraph. In other words, they really struggle with topic sentences as well. And therefore you kind of write all over the map. I hate to pick on our ADHD friends, but we might be uh, have an assignment about writing about the three branches of government. And the next thing you know, the kid's writing about uh, a circus in Africa. What? what how, how, how did you get there? You know, you're just drifting off, meandering. You're forgetting the structure of what you're supposed to be writing about. And um, it's just a stream of consciousness all over the map that, uh, that comes out on the paper. You know, you want a quick, you want something that's going to be very helpful. Speech and language therapists have a nice activity they do to help. Um, students with poor sequential production. Here's what I want you to do. Take about three or four, three or four, three by five parts. And I want you to write one sentence on each of the three by five parts, one sentence. And you're gonna arrange them out of order. And what we want our students to do is to be able to put those cards together in the right order. So it tells, uh, 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 it, it makes sense. And what you learn to do immediately is to recognize the overarching or more generic sentence as being the topic sentence. And that tends to come first. You're gonna have some details in the middle. And then there's gonna be little clues, uh, such as a transitional word in summary or whatever that clue might be. Hey, I, I bet that sentence is at the end. And that's gonna clean up a lot of it. 
um, language scaffolding activities. And when students are pretty good at that, with just a sentence, you could put up a, a very, very short uh, a, a paragraph on each of the cards, just a couple of sentences, and now arrange these paragraphs so that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sequential production, pretty important in the writing process. I don't think it's a big stretch to say language is pretty important in the writing process. Students with poor vocabulary skills um, are going to have very simplistic sentence structures and, you know, a lack of cohesive ties. Um, you know, there's just not going to be much, much punch to their writing if there's limitations on our vocabulary development. We always want kids to take a risk and to use, you know, use other words to try to, you know, get into some colorful adjectives to bring that writing to life and breathe some excitement in there. And when it comes to language, again, from a neuropsychological standpoint, most people would say, well, I, I Dr. Pfeiffer, I got that one. Okay, language is in the left hemisphere, and right you are, but not exclusively. You see, a lot of the more objective writing we do in school, an, a report, a narrative, an explanatory type of, of writing endeavor, it's more left hemisphere type of writing. See, the left hemisphere stores words by way of what we call semantic baskets. So a quick example. In everybody's left hemisphere, you have a little basket called, a, let's say, dogs. And if I could open that basket labeled dogs, you'd have little exemplars in there. You know, a dachshund, a chihuahua, a bichon freeze. We have one of those little monsters that's in the next room. You know, a St. Bernard, whatever. But you have all these examples of dogs. So when we're writing, we go into the left hemisphere and we converge. We open that basket, we converge on a word. We're getting down to that one word that's going to put us over the hump. That's convergent thinking, which a lot of genres require in writing. So we get to middle and high school. What if we're writing poetry? What if we're writing more prosaic types of, of, of uh, written language assignments? How about... Um, Here's a picture and we want to put a funny caption underneath, use a lot of irony, play on words. Uh, how about we're writing song lyrics, okay, which is just a, to me more using that metaphorical type of structure uh, and, and uh, to take perhaps two words that really we wouldn't put in the same semantic basket, but to find some common thread. We call that divergent linguistic skills. And divergent skills are more in the right hemisphere. So in other words, taking two words that on the surface, we don't see a whole lot in common, but finding that unique thread, that's what we do with metaphor. That's what we do with simile. That's what we do with song lyrics. Some of the greatest lyricists, you know, go back to the days of uh, whether it's a Bob Dylan, a John Lennon, uh, a Bono from U2. I mean, even some of the more contemporary rappers, the play on words, it's, it's brilliant. It's a, it's a piece of poetry. Um, finding irony or something funny. This is more divergent. So not everyone's great in every category of writing. Um, and when we get to our autistic friends, they're very good at the convergent writing, the fact writing. You get into simile and metaphor and abstract thinking more that divergent right hemisphere. I don't think so. So much with autism is we are trapped in the scripted routine world of the left hemisphere. Um, and some of those more abstract elements to writing, as well as the humor, the irony, those aspects of writing more dominated by the right hemisphere tend to be lost. Bottom line is vocabulary is important in writing. There's different genres of, of, of writing. No one's perfect at all of them. A lot of school-based writing is geared a little bit more to that expository, explanatory writing, left hemisphere. But that's not to say we don't do a lot of the prosaic stuff, especially at the secondary level. Different style of writing and language is really, we're using both hemispheres when we get into some of that prosaic type writing. And just throwing out some, con we'll tie these constructs together here shortly. I just want to throw out just a uh, give you a little flavor that writing is not located just in one area of the brain. It's pretty complicated. There's a lot going on there uh, with the brain, multiple pathways. But we're going to bring this together in just a minute. I'm going to talk about one other 
cognitive construct, and that's executive functioning. And executive functioning is more what the frontal lobes of the brain does. We're not talking so much about, um, about IQ per se. So for example, IQ is probably, we don't know for sure, but probably back in back of the brain. But executive functioning, as in, yeah, that's the frontal lobes. That's the ability to take that IQ and direct it in an efficient manner for some goal-directed task, a school assignment. Students with strong executive functioning are able to organize their ideas, plan their ideas. They can self-monitor what they're doing while they're doing it. They initiate tasks well, they monitor time. You know, those kinds of things. Look, you can have an IQ, you know, off the charts, 135 IQ by our measures, you're in a gifted and talented program. You're at the 99th percentile, okay? You are a rocket science genius, but you know what? You still might be late for school every day. You still, your, your bedroom at home might be a mess. You still might not remember to bring your, your uh, homework agenda book to school if your mom didn't remind you. That's all that executive function stuff. Success or failure in school is really, it's not so much about IQ. Yes, you need a certain threshold of IQ to get through today's curriculum. Yes. Really success or, or uh, success or successful students in school, it's all about executive functioning, task efficiency, managing your time, being organized, okay? That kind of thing. And that's modulated by an area in the frontal lobe called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Well, that's very nice and that's very interesting, but what in the world does that have to do with writing? Take a look. Executive functioning represents a cluster of important cognitive attributes that allow us to complete tasks efficiently. If you have poor executive functioning, where it comes to writing, you might be poor at task initiation. Therefore, your teacher gives you an assignment and you're just sitting there. You don't know how to get started. Why do you not know how to get started? It looks to me like you're lazy. I don't think so. Because you don't have a plan. You don't even know where to begin. You're, it's, 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 it's almost overwhelming. These kids to me lack what I call cognitive inertia. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you might give the instructions to an assignment, but you have to go you know, come up to Billy and say, you know, give them again, and, or maybe really walk Billy through to get that first sentence down on paper, get some cognitive inertia going, and let them then move along from there. Kids with poor executive functioning don't sustain their attention very well. They have attention issues. And if you have attention issues in writing, you lose track of your thoughts, you don't finish what you start, your sentences look a little disjointed. Kids with poor executive functioning uh, often have poor response in addition. In other words, in plain English, they're distractible. They start writing, someone comes into the classroom, there's an announcement on the overhead, kids talking in the background, they can't tune that stuff out. Okay, they get distracted, and then when they get back to their task of what they're doing, they forget what the heck they were thinking about in the first place. Next thing you know, 20 minutes go by, they have one sentence down on the paper, and we all jump to the, you know, these overly moralistic conclusions. Oh, Billy doesn't try, he doesn't care, he's unmotivated, look, he's just goofing around. I don't know about all that. You know, a lot of times, it's just such a difficult task. You don't know how to get started. Kids with poor executive functioning have a hard time shifting from one paragraph to the next. In other words, they get stuck on topics and perseverate. Uh, we see this quite a bit. If you have a traumatic brain injury, perseveration, getting stuck, having a hard time moving past something. Uh, kids with good executive functioning have what we call good cognitive flexibility, a little bit more resilient and adaptable. Students, the hallmark feature with poor executive functioning and writing is, is you lack organization and planning skills, okay? which is so important in the writing process to plan out your thoughts and, and to be organized. And the next, you know, what you see is a, a lot of erasers, forgetting what the heck you're supposed to be writing about, disjointed content, your content, your ideas don't flow, um, because nothing was thought out. You work too impulsively. Uh, executive functioning and frontal lobes also help out with word retrieval, and they allow us to pay attention and self-monitor what we're doing while we're doing it. 
well, wow, that's a quick sort of synopsis of all, all over the brain. I talked about the frontal lobes. I talked about attention and sequencing our thoughts and language being in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and all this executive functioning stuff. Feels like I just learned uh, you know, uh, neuroanatomy 101 in the last 15 minutes. Well, look, the brain terms are important, but let's kind of put this together of how, how does this all go together when we look at writing? And basically uh, what I talk about in my books, as well as the test, our assessment measure, which we're super proud of, and that just came out uh, uh, this past summer, which we'll mention at the end. Is at the end of the day, students are gonna fall into um, one of three categories, many students more than one of these categories. They're not mutually exclusive. And this gets back to Jennifer's first um, straw poll she put out. What are your concerns with writing? And she hit it nail on the head. The first subtype of written language disorder you can have is called graphomotor dysgraphia. Uh, another term for that is an apraxia. And in plain English, what does that mean? I struggle with writing because I can't manipulate one of these things. It's a motor skill deficit. And I'm not going to get into all the different brain regions that help us plan and guide and give feedback uh, to our motor skills. But that's super duper important. It has to be automatic. There's an area in the brain, the basal ganglia, that develops procedural memory. Or let's put it another way, automaticity of handwriting. And the bottom line is this. You have to be focused on the content of your thoughts when you're writing, and you cannot be thinking, how do you make a B and a D? They both have a stick in a circle, but then again, so does a P and a Q. I forget which way it goes. You can't be thinking about it. It has to be automatic. Just like when you go to the bank and you sign your name, do you find that uh, you know the bank is using your signature to verify that you are you? It just has to be automatic. In fact, if you think about how your hand signs your name, it might throw your signature off. That's procedural memory. It just has to be done automatically. Get the frontal lobes out of it. Don't think about it. Let the basal ganglia, those automatic brain centers, take command of the process. My issue here is that we have a lot of schools that no, no longer teach formal handwriting to students. And I think that's a problem. Now I'm old fashioned. I know it's a digital world. We just need to know keyboarding. And you're right, keyboarding is important, but I'm old fashioned. I still think you need to use one of these things. And I see more and more schools not teaching handwriting. Oh, they'll just kind of get it. Now, you know, it needs to be automatic. Be that as it may, our first subtype, graphomotor dysgraphia, you struggle with writing because the process is not automatic. The basal ganglia has not taken command and control over the process. You've got to consciously think about how to formulate uh, your letters or, and or you just don't have the motor dexterity to execute the stroke. The second type of written language disorder of our big three that we can have is something called the dyslexic dysgraphia. And what I mean here is basically you're dyslexic. And if you look at the International Dyslexia Association's definition of dyslexia, it not only impairs reading, but it impairs spelling and writing as well. And you can have what we call dysphonetic dyslex uh, dyslexia. That means I struggle to sound out words. Well, guess what? You're gonna have dysphonetic dysgraphia because if you can't sound out words and decode them to read, you can't do the same when you're spelling. The hallmark feature, every sound you hear has to be represented by a letter and you are not doing that. You are not representing every sound that you hear in a word by an actual symbol. So usually um, uh, look at those spelling errors and compare them to this. Surface, we talk about surface dyslexia in our reading workshop. That's the kind of dyslexia where I can sound the words out just fine, but reading them quickly and fluently is a problem. I mean, I can go at, at, cat and figure out it's cat. Might take me forever in a day, but I can sound out each of the individual sounds. You know, the breakdown here is something that educators call orthography. In other words, 
in the English language, I can't just rely on the sounds to spell words accurately. Otherwise, I would spell laugh, L-A-F. I would spell juice, J-U-S-C. I would spell mighty, M-I-T-E. The only way that I know laugh has a G-H in it and not an F is I have to visualize the word. So uh, students with surface dysgraphia, they have spelling miscues, not so much that they can't sound out the word, they can't visualize the word. You want to be a good speller, you have to hear the breakdown of the individual sounds. And if you can't do that, it's basket A. But in addition, you have to visualize the word, especially in a goofy language like English, where 25% of our words are not phonologically consistent words. This bright idea was it to put the letter B in the word debt. Why does yacht have a C and an H in there? I don't know. So the only way to spell that correctly is I have to visualize the word. And if I can't do either one, then I have mixed dysgraphia, which is simply my spelling is so bad that my spell check on my computer says, what in the world are you talking about? We have no idea. That refers to significant spelling errors because I struggle to not only hear the sounds in the word, but also to visualize the correct spelling of the word in the mind's eye. Look, if I were to ask Jennifer to spell the word reconnaissance, she'd say, hold on there, Dr. Pfeiffer, and she would write down the word reconnaissance on a piece of paper, and she'd pull back to see if it looked right. And if, when Jennifer pulls back to see if it looks right, she's comparing what she put on paper, she's comparing that to the cognitive template in the mind's eye. That cognitive template, that visual spatial sort of the image we form in our mind's eye of what the correct spelling is, educators call that orthography. You want to be a good speller? Hear the sounds. Phonology. Visualize the word. Orthography. And if you can't do either one, ugh, we're going to have really rough spelling. Mixed dysgraphia. So if our first subtype has to do with motor skill deficits, and our second subtype is a manifestation of dyslexia, re you know, rearing its ugly head into the writing process by wreaking havoc on spelling. The third and final subtype is really a manifestation of what we're going to call executive dysgraphia. And basically, it's a frontal lobe or an executive functioning problem. And executive dysgraphia could mean a lot of things. But the bottom line with executive dysgraphia, the hallmark feature, I can sum it up in two words, poor production. Hey, you know, Billy has a lot of ideas in his head. He does great in a classroom discussion. Now we go back and have a 20 minute uh, uh, exercise to put it on paper, he gives me nothing. And the problem might be, Billy might struggle to retrieve the word, to actually a word retrieval issue, to pull the words into conscious awareness. Billy might have a trouble holding, holding, holding on to the words. So you need some memory to hold on to those words uh, so you can put them on paper. Or maybe the problem is the syntactical arrangement and organization of the word. So when we talk about executive dysgraphia, it's a whole host of issues that lead to poor production. Either a hard time retrieving the word, a hard time to hold, hold, hold the words long enough in memory to put, produce them in a paper and pencil fashion. Or you can retrieve the words, you can hold on to them. You have a hard time organizing and arranging your thoughts. It just it comes out, you know, kind of discombobulated and, and, and disjointed sentences and, and those sorts of things. So in the schools the, of these three subtypes, with a motor skill deficit, a spelling deficit, or executive dysgraphia, this one right here, executive, that's where most of my referrals come. That's where teachers tend to refer things to me. If it's more of a motor skill issue, it tends to go to the occupational therapist, but the psychologist tends to give the executive dysgraphia. And in our evaluations, we want to try to pinpoint exactly what the problem is with writing, retrieving, memory, or just the syntactical organization and arrangement of our thoughts. Can you have more than one subtype? In fact, some people are looking at this saying, all right, well, my child has a hard time with the motor end of it. Uh, their spelling is atrocious and they get zero down on paper. Can they have all three? Absolutely, absolutely. Any combination of the above. And that's why in our assessments, as we'll show you in two slides, we have to really dig deep 
and find out where the roadblock is that's hindering your writing in order to better stream our interventions. Now, speaking of intervention, I want to get this in. We're going to turn this over for questions in about five minutes. Um, but if executive dysgraphia seems to be you know, the most common type of written language uh, issue, kids just struggle to get their thoughts on paper in an organized fashion, um, let's follow Ray's steps to help us out. Uh, most teachers will use graphic organizers. So let's say we're going to write about my home state here of Maryland. Um, you might form a graphic organizer and turn. Let's the first thing we're going to do is turn it into a a brain dump. Let's just make lists of things. So over here, I want you to list all the cities in Maryland: Rockville, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Silver Spring, Baltimore. Okay. Now all the politicians of importance in Maryland. Now I want you to list all the uh, important businesses in Maryland. Now I want to uh, list the, the, the crops and agriculture that seem to dominate the Western part of our state. So you start out with graphic organizers, which the writing, you, you know, the main thing we need to get across the kids, you're not going to get it perfect up here and then put it down on paper. It doesn't work that way. Writing is a process. And it's going to start out with just listing some things out in an organized fashion. Then I want you to go back to those you know, little brain dumps you did, and we're going to teach you how to craft the topic sentence. And uh, because paragraph flow has to go from general to specific. So I want a topic sentence for all the cities in Maryland, and now a topic sentence for all the businesses in Maryland, and now a topic sentence for all the politicians in Maryland. In other words, do all your topic sentences at once. And once you've established that topic sentence in the drafting stage, now you go to the revising stage and you've got your topic sentence, now fill in some detail. And it's gonna be a lot easier filling in detail once the topic sentence is established, but also when you know the topic sentence already for the next paragraph. That will then make sure that you just list detail that pertains to this paragraph and it's also going to help you get out of that paragraph a lot easier because you know where you're going to the next paragraph. Then we can begin to teach you some transitional words, therefore, however, in conclusion, to sort of give your writing a little flow and rhythm. Uh, then we can do an editing exercise. I like the COP strategy personally. COP strategy is uh, C-O-P-S, COPS. We're not going to say proofread your, your work. We're going to say be a directional proofreader. Go back and make sure every sentence has a capital letter. COPS, capital letter. Now go back and make sure everything's organized. That means you have paragraphs. Now proofread a third time for punctuation errors, a fourth time for spelling errors. C-O-P-S. If you ask a student to proofread once and look for everything, they will get you nothing. We're going to teach students to be directional proofreaders and only look for one attribute each time. Lastly, trade papers with peer and uh, get them, uh, have them uh, provide some, some feedback. Often we use a writing rubric and have the students see how this paper matches up to that rubric. Uh, when students can play the role of the teacher, uh, it helps them really learn and solidify these important skills in writing when you can kind of uh, play that role of a teacher and be on the evaluating side. It gives you a better idea of what, you know, what a good or an average or an excellent passage might look like. You know, I mentioned uh, in, in closing, we try to look at these three big aspects of writing, motor, spelling, and executive. And uh, this is uh, in, in a way to assess if this is what we're doing at Monocacy. This was uh, when I'm not doing workshops and when I'm not um, uh, uh, assessing kids, uh, my primary duties is I am a test developer these days and I work for PAR, Psychological Assessment Resources. They're in Tampa, Florida. So this was our five-year project released just this past summer. Uh, this is our test called the FAW. It's a writing test and guess what it covers? Pre-K to college students, 12 subtests in the whole battery. You only have to do the first 10. What does it say? Do you have a graphomotor issue? Is it more of a spelling dyslexia issue? Or is it more one of these executive, you know, 
attributes, poor, poor retrieval, poor memory, poor organization. In other words, this is a diagnostic achievement test. We're not so much concerned where you are, third grade level, fourth grade level, fifth grade level in writing. We're more concerned why you're there. We're going to get into the processes that contribute to writing and see where you are when we break down these individual processes um, as a better way to determine what we feel to scrappy and kids. We also have our screener battery, which takes about eight to 10 minutes to give the whole test, about 50 minutes. Um, but the screener, if uh, you just want to screen your kids uh, real quickly uh, in the classroom, uh, we have and there are not a lot of writing screeners. Um, we have two of them on the fall for younger kids, more of a motor screener for older kids, more cognitive and reflective. Well, normally it takes me a full day to cover that kind of material, but we just zip through things in about 50 minutes. I hopefully gave you a, a bit of an idea and recap of how we define dysgraphia. Um, some of the brain mechanisms involved with writing because it's it's a pretty difficult process. Uh, how we look at it uh, in terms of from the neuroscience perspective of the different kinds and subtypes and how we're testing for that. With that said, I'm gonna turn things back over to Jennifer and see what questions do we have or people saying, I'm exhausted, say that again. <laughs> No, lots of good feedback. And there's a lot of questions in here too. Um, we may not get to them all today. And if so, people can uh, sign up for our newsletter and our blogs at describeable.life. Um, and we will try to answer many of them later. But I think I'm going to go with a couple big picture themes to start. I think the first one is diagnosing dysgraphia. We got a couple questions around this. Um, what professionals can officially diagnose dysgraphia? Uh, how do you de define di or diagnose dysgraphia versus dyslexia? And sort of what tools do you need? Do you need an OT consult? Do you need, you know, what, what is necessary for that type of diagnosis? Yeah, really good question. So if, um, again, dysgraphia is a fancy word for learning disability and writing. So the schools, many schools, for example, Maryland, in 2019, Maryland just started recognizing dyslexia. Prior to that, we just call it a learning disability in reading. Right now, where we are with the schools, we're calling it a learning disability in writing. It would be your school team led by your psychologist doing the evaluation. If the referral question involves motor skills, you want the occupational therapist to be a part of that evaluation. Uh, in fact, an OT is in a really good position to diagnose uh, uh, a motor issue or an apraxia, much more so really than, than a psychologist. Um, if you're not in the school and you're going outside the schools, um, you definitely want you know, a licensed psychologist who's going to look at um, basically a learning disability in writing. I try to write my report using the language that my audience is comfortable with. And if schools, right, wrong, or indifferent, and I think Jennifer's group is going to be changing this uh, soon, but if they're not recognizing the term dysgraphia, then I'm gonna call it a learning disability in writing, and here's why. The most important thing for me is the student receive the services and interventions that they're helpful with. I think um, where dysgraphia is right now is maybe where dyslexia was five, five eight, 10 years ago. And with your group, you're going to have the same impact that dyslexia had, and you're going to force the issue on a legislative level to make people recognize this. I appreciate that. We definitely would like to spread the awareness, and that's why we're doing things like this. So thank you. Um, a few specific questions on your tools and your screeners, how to access them and how to get how to be able to use the screener, um, if you want to comment on how they can find those tools or who they should reach out to. Yeah, so uh, the bottom left-hand corner of this particular slide, you see PAR, P-A-R. Um, that stands for Psychological Assessment Resources. They're probably the second largest um, testing company in the States, that of Tampa. Uh, just go ahead and Google PAR and uh, 
just uh, what will come up. You can um, click on the link and you can just type in the FA FAW and read all about it and ordering information and even let them know you attended this webinar. Dr. Pfeiffer said, give you a discount. Um, <laughs> I get in trouble for that. No, you can certainly say you heard about it through me through this webinar, but uh, PAR is the publisher. Okay, great. Um, and then a number of questions around assistive technology and typing. You know, do you, they came in different forms. Do you recommend specific assistive technology like um, CodeWriter or FFX for math? Do you think that handwriting practice will eventually make progress, like cause these kids to make progress. There, there's somebody asking if there's any evidence that if someone practices it over and over, they'll actually overcome some of the handwriting difficulties. And sort of where do you stand on repeated handwriting practice versus assistive technology and that balance there? Sure, a lot to those questions. So yeah. if I miss something, help me out on the answer, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of handwriting programs. We did review a number in our book. They don't have the greatest research to back them. There is one exception, handwriting without tears. Handwriting without tears is excellent. Um, and it's a it's a way to learn writing that's painless. And, and by, by that, I mean, okay, we're gonna learn a C, everyone make a C. Now you're gonna make an O, that's just a C and come up, a C and come up. Now you're gonna make an A, make the C come up and draw down. So you start to build and build on the motor stroke in a fun, way. Um, and the research on hearing without tears is, is very good. I'm old fashioned. I still think we need to teach handwriting. As far as assistive technology, um, it's a great tool and we put it in our tool belt. I'm going to use assistive technology. Let's say I have someone in basket number one. They have an apraxia. Maybe they have cerebral palsy. Maybe they have hemiparesis, which is weakness on one side of their body. There is a true motor skill deficit and frankly, I'm not sure we're going to overcome that. Then we're going to select a bypass strategy. Hey, let's bypass the motor issue with technology and, you know, use some of this Kurzweil technology, for example, uh, text-to-speech software to bypass the motor demands, but we're still writing. So for those students, absolutely. Uh, for me, if my opinion, and Jennifer, you're welcome to comment, uh, mm -hmm. for the younger students who are developmentally learning this skill, I say we teach them handwriting. I'm going with that until there's some motoric physical reason that they cannot learn this. No, I think, you know, I'm very evidence-based too, like you are. I think that evidence isn't out there as much for assistive technology yet. I have found um, in personal situations that it can be very helpful on the idea generation side for kids whose brains are working too fast for what they can put on paper. If they can talk to text or use some of the tools like co-writer, things like that to get stuff out, um, sometimes that helps them on a first draft, but then the writing skills are important for many places too. So I personally, I use kind of both, but I think we um, there's a lot of different ways to handle it depending on your specific child and which areas they struggle in. Yeah, and you know, it comes up a lot. I think the equivalent, it, when I do the math workshop, it's the same thing with calculators. And, and to me, it's a tool. It goes in your tool belt. There's a good use to, of calculators, but you can go too far and cross that line. And now the calculator is thinking mathematically for you. We want to stay on this side of the line and use it as, a, as an effective learning tool. Uh, to me, I'm okay with that. That makes sense. Um, lots of questions that are basically asking for your best recommendations for accommodations and interventions, particularly in the third through sixth and middle school kind of levels. Uh, do you have specific interventions or accommodations that you recommend for kids in those areas? And I imagine it, it depends on the categories, but would let you. Yeah, that's why uh, the first thing I recommend is we do an assessment to see specifically what the issues are. Let's face it, here's the number one recommendation everybody wants. Everybody wants more time. Everyone wants more time uh, uh, for starters. Uh, if you have a student a little bit bent on the ADHD side, uh, look, keyboarding is the way to go. Uh, it, 
an average ordinary typist can go 40 words per minute. And I defy anyone out there, you try writing 40 words a minute. And in fact, if you can do it, do it for three straight minutes, your right hand is gonna fall off. But the quicker you can speed up output, and that's what keyboarding does, the less pressure that puts, certainly on working memory. If note-taking is an issue a lot, especially at the middle school, where we're kind of getting into that a little bit more by sixth grade, um, you know, a lot of teachers are uh, putting their notes on Google Classroom. Well, rather than take notes by freehand, um, have teachers start with just kind of fill in the blanks at first, rather than writing these this long narrative. I think note-taking is a really hard skill uh, to, to learn. That's a nice way to ease into it. Um, what a nice piece of technology. Um, a lot of our college kids and high school kids, we recommend uh, the live scribe pen. I don't know, would, remember when you're in college, you probably, Jennifer, would, we probably walked in with our tape recorders to tape record mm -hmm. the lecture. Um, the live scribe pen, you can pick that up at a Target or Walmart, Best Buy. Uh, $99 has a little computer chip, looks just like this pen, records the lecture uh, for you and syncs it up with your notes. Um, there's, there's awesome pieces of technology that really help us um, with writing. You mentioned some of those uh, word finding, uh, inspirations and kidspirations are computer programs that'll help uh, with organization, with word finding, um, things of that nature. Uh, but the bottom line with writing, unlike reading where we have formal programs, Linda Boot Bell, Orton Gillingham, Read Naturally, Read 180, and we have formal programs. Writing, it's more about a strategic type of intervention as opposed to a whole program with one exception. Maybe that's a, a handwriting program where you go start to finish. So the question is what strategies and what accommodations would best benefit your particular child and well, hopefully that's where the good, a good evaluation will point us in that direction. Yeah, that makes sense to that. And the reference to sort of the Orton Gillingham based program, someone asked, is there direct explicit instruction for dysgraphia? And we also got a lot of questions about for sort of the executive function pieces of it. If there's any way to teach explicit um, sequential skills there. Yeah, I think it's more strategies. Um, well, let's keep a couple of things in mind with executive functioning. Um, frontal lobe of the brain, last part of the brain to myelinate, myelinate and develop. So we, we're gonna expect that that's gonna be a process that's going to be ongoing um, uh, you know, to, to learn. Um, I think the, the graphic organizers are a must. I think the very first thing, more than anything else, what I talk to teachers about, and they're very much in agreement, and parents, Kids have this perception, I got to get it perfect here and then just replicate it down there. And I think, you know, we teach that writing is a process and we're going to do a few drafts. And the graphic organizer is just a way to get us started, just to dump some words and phrases down in little categories. And then we're going to go to that next step to learn how to stitch those together. Um, a big component of that executive dysgraphia is to learn paragraph flow. And that goes from general to specific and to recognize and learn how to craft the topic sentence. That seems to be a really big sticking point is lack of a topic sentence in a paragraph. And therefore your paragraph doesn't go from general to specific. It just kind of meanders anywhere. And uh, it's very hard to pull our thoughts together. What it, it, Things come out pretty disorganized. Um, and that's, that's how we begin to sharpen that structure for kids. Sounds good. I know a bunch of people are commenting that they're dropping off. So I'm going to put the last poll up, which is just sort of um, to, uh, for us to understand, if I can get it up, for us to understand if more webinars would be helpful to everyone in the future. But in the meantime, I think we have Dr. Pfeiffer for a few more minutes. So we will keep asking um, a few of these questions. There were a few comments about gifted students and it being even harder to recognize um, gifted students who have this or how do you handle that? I'm, I'm just curious if you have any comments on that sort of 2E classification or students who ha have giftedness and also some type of learning disability. 
Yeah, um, you know, it's the same old thing. Uh, you know, giftedness is just, it's another way of saying you have an extremely high IQ. And the higher your IQ is, the greater the academic expectations we have for you. And when your writing is coming out, wow, what's this? It's very unexpected, isn't it? It's unexpected underachievement, uh, given that your math is probably, you know, at a 12th grade level and you're only in the fourth grade, you're just off the charts. Um, you know, I, I find sometimes, and I don't want to do these sweeping overgeneralizations, is that some of the gifted students don't have the patience for this, that things come so quickly and easily and naturally. But writing is, uh, requires some patience. Um, it requires some organization. Um, if we have any sort of anxiety, uh, which a lot of times there's an undercurrent of anxiety in the gifted population, any kind of anxiety or attention issues, that's the part that needs uh, that that needs to be addressed. So, you know, whether your IQ is 100 or 130, um, oftentimes the interventions are uh, uh, tend to be similar depending on where the breakdown is in particular uh, with with your writing with your writing skills. Great. Um, one practical question that might be useful to lots of people. Are there places that you recommend looking for graphic organizers or examples? I know we have a Pinterest page where we, we post them a lot, but I don't know if there's any officially recommended ones. <laughs> you know, for me, there are, um, I, I would use Jennifer's posting. I have <laughs> seen books of graphic organizers that to me, as the layperson looking at this, look so immensely complicated and intimidating, I found simple is best. Just keep it as simple and straightforward. So some of the things perhaps that you, you pulled and, uh, and maybe they're on the website or you posted uh, a link to those resources, I think are more than appropriate. I, I would not get too fancy when it comes to graphic organizers. Great. Um, and I'll say something to consider for the future. We got a request that you do a uh, webinar for the kids with dysgraphia themselves at their level so they can understand what's going on. So something for us folks to think about going forward. <laughs> We can talk about that down the road. Uh, yeah, absolutely. exactly. I, I hadn't even thought of that either, but it, it's a great suggestion. So uh, we, we can talk about it. Um, and, and people are commenting in the chat now that their students would be great for their students. So well, I want to extend my very huge thanks to you. This was great. We're getting a lot of very positive response. People are saying they do want to see more webinars, including kids' webinars. But um, I, I really appreciate your time today and thank you to everyone who is attending. We will try to compile some of the questions and answers and put them on our blog and newsletter list. So if you've not signed up for the Dysgraphia Life newsletter, you can do it right on the website, www.dysgraphia.life. And a huge thank you to Dr. Pfeiffer. I will send you all these. Thank you so much. This was amazing comments that are in the chat. And we really appreciate your time today. Well, thanks for having me, Jennifer. I really appreciate uh, and am very impressed with the work you're doing. And anything that I can assist uh, you on down the road, please reach out. I'm not far. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.